I'm with Brendan O'Neill, everyone. Welcome to Walk-Ins Welcome. I wish you were on this show every week um, <laughs> so we could go through the week's news. Brendan is a writer at, where are you writing? Spiked primarily? Spiked, Spiked primarily. I also write for The Spectator and The Daily Mail over here in Britain. Yeah. And he has a book coming out. Please tell us about your book. Yeah, my book is called After the Pogrom. Uh, 7th of October, Israel and the Crisis of Civilization. And yes, it is as despairing as the title suggests. It's about <laughs> the, the aftermath of Hamas's attack a year ago and, and what it told us about the West and how, how much the West has lost the plot. That's essentially what it's about. Yeah. So to finish my train of thought before we get into that, <laughs> because your book is, it is like, a, I mean, we'll get into it. It was, um, I was... I was, uh, I thought I was high functioning, a high functioning alcoholic. And it's interesting we're talking about this because I'm about to have 11, if I make it that far, 11 years in like two weeks of right. sobriety, which is insane yeah. for me to really comprehend. Wow. And yeah, not it's one not, drink in 11 years. Not one drink. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Not one drink, not a hangover, not no weed, nothing, not even like California sober. Wow. And, uh, it is amazing considering what a hot mess express I was. I, <laughs> I was, I considered myself high functioning until I quit. And then I realized how not high functioning I actually was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because now I'm capable of so much more yeah. than I even was capable of. And I thought that I was, and I was like a, a huge stoner too, on top of it and was a very, high functioning, motivated stoner, but I think, and I thought it made me creative. And, and I think that it, this, the stakes got a lot higher too. When I started engaging in the discourse, you know, being right. on Twitter and suddenly yeah. writing a playboy. And I was like, I don't have the luxury of not being able to back up what I'm saying <laughs> in a clear head anymore. Yeah. Well, I'm very anti weed. I think I think weed makes people stupid over the long run. Uh, I'm I'm very pro <laughs> pro decriminalization. I think people should be able to smoke and inject whatever they want. I believe in individual freedom, but I don't think people should smoke weed. You know, uh, the thing I like about alcohol is that it's the social lubricant. It makes you want to socialize. It makes you want to talk to people, chat to people, try to get off with someone, uh, have a fight. It it, it it makes you more of a social creature. Whereas I think the thing about weed is it kind of drives you further into yourself. It kind mm -hmm. of makes you a bit self-obsessed and myopic. And you might sit around in a small group of people eating crisps or eating chips, as you guys would say, but it doesn't really bring out the social beast inside. And I think that's one of the good things that booze does. It kind of unleashes our our social animal, which is, you know, exciting and strange and sometimes risky, but good yeah i'd argue there's probably more violence done and death yeah. caused under the influence of alcohol than weed but i i do agree that it weed is i always said like it you you won't nothing will happen but nothing will happen yeah you know it's not like you're gonna get into highly unlikely with with alcohol if you have a problem with alcohol eventually those consequences are going to make their self themselves known to you, society at large, your, you know, God forbid you do something horrific, but at the very least you might get a DUI, you might show up drunk and lose your job or sleep through an important thing or yeah. come home and be nasty to your family and lose your wife or, and there will be generally very severe consequences eventually. Whereas with weed, it's so insidious you might sit on the couch for a long time before you realize that you have a problem and nothing yeah. will happen. You know, w w I don't disagree with that. And I think that's actually one reason why more and more of the establishment is actually becoming pro weed. So the last time I was in the USA, my mind was blown because I went into Barnes and Noble in Union Square and there were weed magazines. You could buy marijuana themed yeah. magazines, which oh, had yeah. recipes and all sorts of things. And, you know, here in the UK, you'll often hear politicians saying, decriminalize marijuana, but we want tighter restrictions on the sales of alcohol because 
I think there's this instinctive recognition amongst the establishment that weed is a very pacifying drug. It keeps people slightly suppressed, whereas booze is a much more unpredictable phenomenon. You never quite know how it's going to interact with someone's personality or their mood. You know, there was this experiment in Portugal a few years ago in Portugal, there was a huge football tournament and all the English fans went over there and English fans are notoriously rowdy. They have hooligan <laughs> tendencies. And the police in Portugal put out all these posters saying to the English fans, have you ever thought about smoking weed? Why don't you avoid the pubs here in Portugal and have a doobie instead because they wanted to pacify these young English working class lads who turned up on their shores. So I don't know, there's something about, I fully support people who go sober. Lots of my friends have been sober for some time and I would never say to them, just have one drink with me. But I do think there's something about the kind of anti-booze worldview of some people in positions of power that makes yeah. me slightly uncomfortable because it's it's like they want to keep us in a box and they know that yeah. booze helps us get out of that box. Well, yeah. What is that expression that I love? A drunk man's words or a sober man's thoughts. And yeah. I always used to say red, red wine makes me weepy. And I'm a writer and an artist and a creative and giving up that whole like I'm a, you know, dr like drinking while I write and that kind of self perception as a alcoholic writer was very chal I didn't actually think I'd ever write again after I quit drinking and it was very difficult and yeah, smoking well, weed and I am definitely not a like anti alcohol I I always joke on stage I'm like have a drink for me like <laughs> go get a DUI like I don't yeah. care I <laughs> and, you know, people will clap when I tell them I quit drinking. I'm like, no one wants to quit drinking. We have to yeah. do this. It's not something yeah. I would, I, I like, don't do it unless you absolutely have to do it. I would never tell anyone to do it. And I think it's like in one of these books I have behind me, it is one of the oldest pieces of of anything. I think this this exhibit actually was over on your side of the the pond. Um, there, it was like the world in a hundred objects. Have you ever seen this exhibit? I've heard of it. And yeah. I've always wanted to see it. And one of the, one of the objects is basically an invent, a beer inventory from, it's like, we've been trying to get out of here for 5,000 years, you know, as yeah. long as, yeah. as I, I don't think it's a natural state. I actually don't think sobriety is really. And, you know, it's I wonder, too, <laughs> no, it's not. And I actually wonder how much it incur increases my ability to lie to my not lie to myself, but kind of uh, build walls around maybe truths that I don't want to have to mm. face that, like you say, would inevitably come out once you lubricate the, the self. Yeah, I mean, I I'm not going to lie. I love a drink. Um I'm having a PIMS as we speak. I know that sounds like the most British thing anyone's ever said on your podcast, but I am <laughs> literally drinking a PIMS and lemonade right now. Um, <laughs> uh, I love a drink, but I one I used to drink and write at the same time as you've just described. And that's when I knew it was getting a bit much because if you are reliant on drink or you think you're reliant on drink in order to write well, then you're going to get in a bit of a mess. You know, what was it? Brendan Behan used to say, the great Irish writer, Brendan Behan used to say that he was a drinker with a drinker with writing problems. And that's, <laughs> that's often how I felt in recent years. And, you know, that's when you have to switch it around. At least if you're a writer with drinking problems, that's a bit more manageable. Yeah. Did you, um, yeah, this, your book that is, it really is, it is enraging actually. It's particularly the intro and just, I hadn't, I feel like I've kind of compartmentalized it and put it in a box because I couldn't live there forever because I was one of the people who was out and felt kind of isolated. I didn't realize it until even after the fact, I just reacted like a, like a, what I thought would be in the morally clear way that you should react to a, an, <laughs> an incident like October 7th. Yeah. And I was not, it, I was kind of alone out there with some people, but it wasn't what I realized the dominant reaction to that situation as you very articulately lay out. And I forgot how mad I was 
in the aftermath at and when you put it like all the schools and the the posters and all i was like oh i've blocked this out i've yeah. blocked all of this out because that made me so mad and it was so dark and my husband was like you've got to get offline you have to like get a, and the like dead babies everywhere on social media and it was just um i forgot i i have i feel like i've like eternally tried to sunshine that and you have done a good job of really cataloging that aftermath the reaction to it uh in the west and saying you know we can't ignore this we need to look at this and we need to break it down what ins what other than that reaction inspired you to write this book well it's largely because of what you've just said there which i just thought you know, people need to be reminded of this because I'd forgotten a lot of it as well. So one mm. thing that I'd forgotten, for example, is that there was a gathering outside the Israeli embassy in London about 36 hours after Hamas's attack. And I remember at the time thinking, that's really weird because Israel hasn't done anything yet. Why are they protesting outside the Israeli embassy? And then you read the reports, you read that there was dance music playing from their sound systems, that people were singing, people were waving the Palestine flag, people were cheering and whooping and laughing. And you think, oh, right, okay, this was a celebration of a racist pogrom outside the Israeli embassy in London in 2023. And you kind mm -hmm. of have to, it kind of takes your breath away when you realize that that's what happened. And I make the point in my book that we would remember if people had poured onto the streets of London to celebrate Kristallnacht. So we should remember that they did it for 7th of October. And right. so there were so many incidents like that that took place in our, in our cities in the West after the 7th of October that I had forgotten. And I just thought, I've got to sit down and, and, and write this down. And it, it's interesting what you say, because lots of people have told me that they've had the same response. I spoke to a Swedish friend of mine earlier today, and he said, after every chapter, he had to go for a run because he was so yeah. enraged and so angry. And that's kind of, uh, I got so angry while I was writing the book. I was fuming. I was kind of smashing at my keyboard because I was researching all the things that had happened, which I had partly forgotten about. So if this book makes people angry, I think that's an achievement and and it's a good start. It It, it is. Um, it comes through but you're such a good writer i was saying before we even started recording i just it's like the kind of writing that makes me want to quit it's so good there's so many lines i was reading it to my husband just like line after line paragraph after paragraph i was just being that annoying person and uh he was just like yeah he's he's very very clear about these um the way you kind of fold it into the just and this was the kind of mind bending thing about that moment was the anti race I actually copy and pasted this just so I could accurately quote it because it's like the self styled anti fascist cozy up to the fascists of Ham Hamas why did anti racists make excuses for racist violence why did feminists whose mantras believe women refused to believe that women were raped on October 7th. How did some of the highest seats of learning in Christendom become overrun by apologists for barbarism? It's, it was all of that weird, like the, 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 and also your explanation of how the, and, you know, decolonizing mindset, why we shouldn't be surprised that this is actually what's yeah. happened. And yeah. I don't, I feel like I wanted your chapter, the lore of barbarism to be longer because right. What is the lure? You can feel that you wrote this in like a passionate. I could feel your anger, and I was getting, I, I was getting enraged as I was reading it, and I wanted, but I wanted to understand what is that lure of barbarism? Is this like what Jonah Goldberg writes about? You know, we're just living in a time where we've kind of managed to get on top of it for a minute as humans, but it's really just our default setting. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I wrote the book in um, about, around four weeks. I went to my parents' house on the west coast of Ireland in the middle of nowhere next to the Atlantic Ocean, and I thought this will be a good place to write, and it, it was a good place to write. The problem is that there's lots of alcohol there, so that was a bit of a temptation. Um, but that's where I decided to go to write it 
and I wanted to write it fast and I wanted to get that feeling of anger that was bubbling up in me as I was researching it and getting my thoughts together. In the in the first chapter, The Law of Barbarism, which you've quoted from there, I, I think the aim of that chapter is to give people a taste of what's coming in the book. So right. I, I, I and and it doesn't explain everything. You know, each chapter is four thousand words. So each chapter is quite short. There's ten mm -hmm. chapters in in total. So it's actually a short, pretty polemical book. Um and I wanted to give a taste in that opening chapter about what the subsequent chapters were going to talk about. So later in the book, there's a whole chapter on university campuses and the extraordinary hypocrisy of the student activist class who for the past 10 years have said it's racist for a white kid to eat sushi. And now they are cheering on one of the worst acts of racist violence of modern times. Um, so there's a chapter looking, you know, what's going on there. And then there's, there's also a chapter later on about decolonization and decolonization on campuses, in museums, yep. in libraries, and looking at the links between decolonization over here and this violent act of decolonization that Hamas carried out on 7th of October, you know, seeing both of them as revolts against modernity, as revolts against civilization, essentially. So yeah, the opening chapter is really about giving a taste of what's to come. And then in some of the other chapters, I dig a little deeper into these phenomena. But but the book is not, it's not a work of sociological analysis. That's not really right. what, I, what I trade in. I trade in uh, polemics and I, and I want to get people's juices flowing. I want people yeah. to, to feel something and to say, and to ask questions and to say, well, this isn't right. And, and maybe we need to talk about it. So that's, that's the fundamental aim of the book. And I think it's landed like that for some people. Yeah. Oh, it landed like that for me because I don't know what the, you know, you talk a, a bit about how, what we can do, but I don't fully know what we mm. can do. You know, I've been joking about this on my show. We had one that was like, I kept calling it Hamas girl summer. And <laughs> it is, and you talk a lot about this too, where it's become like a fashion statement. And it's the, you know, the kafi is the sign of kind of being in the in crowd and being cool. And, and it is, you know, a, 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 a weird also symbol of, of genocide, genocidal maniacs. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know when the youth have been kind of taken over by this ideology. I don't, I'm not sure how you, I don't know how you undo it. I, I don't know either. And, and my book is, um, it's pretty short on solutions because I don't know what the solutions are. I, I just, I know that the, the there starting- There's only one solution. No, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, <laughs> that was an inappropriate joke. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's, that's, that's <laughs> perfectly put. Um, I think it is, uh, I think the first step is to say, look, everything is pretty fucked up. And mm -hmm. once you, once we're honest about that, we don't have to be despairing about it. We we can we can have fun with it as well as saying this is actually a serious problem. Um, you know, once we acknowledge that everything is fucked up, then I, that's the first step, I think, to trying to interrogate it more deeply and to think about how we might address it. You know, it, I think you're right to ask the question of how did we lose so many young people to this strange cult of wokeness or whatever we're supposed to call it, but it has been bubbling up for some time. You know, uh, the response of people like you and, and me, I guess, and lots of other people was mostly to make fun of it and to laugh at students who, you know, who said it was a, a microaggression to ask them, where do you come from? Or, uh, you know, students who who needed to go into a safe room with um, Play-Doh and beanbags because Christina Hoff Summers was turning up on their campus to talk about the, 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 how, yeah. feminine, how feminism lost its way. So we've made fun of those kids for a long time. But I think, <laughs> you know, there was a very serious element to it, which is that right. they were being turned against reason they were being turned against enlightenment they were being educated to be suspicious of western civilization itself and to see their own nations whether it was america or britain to see their own nations as being born from the sins of slavery and colonialism and empire so to have contempt for their own countries 
and to have contempt for the civilization that gave birth to their countries. And one of the points I try to draw out in my book is that if you encourage an entire new generation to turn their backs on civilization, you haven't got the right to be surprised when they get tempted into the arms of barbarism. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. what we've seen since the 7th of October. We have seen significant numbers of educated young people on the streets cheering on essentially one of the most regressive and racist movements on earth, which is Hamas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can wring our hands over that and we can tut tut over that and, and we should. But I think at the same time, we have to say, listen, we've been doing some weird things to these kids for 10 or 20 years. And the end result is what's happened since 7th of October. So we need to have a reckoning with ourselves and our societies as well as with these young people. Right. Getting in shape can be hard. Everybody knows this. It requires hard work, discipline, and in my instance, someone to be accountable to. And that's why I'm excited to partner with Caliber. It has been truly life-changing for me. Caliber is a strength training and nutrition coaching program that's completely personalized to you. Through their app, you get paired with a personal trainer, an actual person, not AI, and they put you on a fitness program and also help out with your nutrition. In my instance, she looked at me and was like, you need double the protein you're getting, and we're going to start with weights two to three times a week. And she tailored that to my needs, what my time is, like where I'm at. It's freaking amazing. It actually has been life-changing for me. I see my body composition changing. I also feel different. And I also, my brain feels so much better just even eating more protein. Like that alone has been a godsend. We've arranged a special deal for our walk-ins welcome listeners and viewers. If you go to caliberstrong.com slash walk-ins, go to that link, you get $100 off your first three months. And you get a 30 day money back guarantee. So click the link below to get signed up, caliberstrong.com slash walk-ins. I'm getting so strong. I am getting strong. Are you tired of wading through media misinformation, trying to figure out a news outlet spin or bias on any given story? If you're like me, you know that everyone has a slant, but Ground News is the solution. Ground News is the most complete news comparison app. It lets you make sense of the news on your own terms by letting you easily compare how a story is covered by different sources across the political spectrum and around the world. I know sometimes in America, we forget the other world exists. This is the other world. <laughs> the rest of the world exists. <laughs> That's how American-centric I am. My father, I signed him up for it. He loves it because he's generally in his own media bubble and has now been using this to kind of sift through. There's a great feature blind spot that shows you, like if you lean more left, here are the stories you probably missed in your silo. If you lean more right, here are the stories you missed from the left wing. Use our affiliate link and get 15% off. That's ground news. Use the link below to get 15% off. I use it every day. I love it. I, I I guess I agree. Like my tendency, has, I'm 40, almost six. My tendency has been to, you know, mock this and kind of sneer at it a bit and, and be like, well, maybe I always used to say you're not woke, you're annoying. You know, I'm like, let's not make a big deal out of it. Let's just kind of try and minimize. But it was, I think post 2020 was when I really saw, you know, Chill, young kids burning down their own cities, their own cities, yeah, and vandalizing stores out of, in the name of capitalism is evil, and looting in the name of we, you know, we've been colonized and they've been looting from a, this kind of eye for an eye mentality and torching small businesses. Um, I really was like, oh no, this is a, I knew it was, I knew it was a dangerous place to go, but really seeing that kind of violence that springs from that ideology of revenge and grievance and uh, frustration. And I actually do think weed, I know that it's like a very unpopular opinion, but I do think that you will see a connection over the years of the rise in weed and this kind of de like complete falling apart of society. <laughs> because 
I the weed is very strong now. So one thing that I did have the luxury of witnessing as someone who smoked from the time that I was 13 to 35 was how strong the weed got. And one year I went to Coachella and I kept calling it Agrochella because I was like, is it like what is in the weed that everyone is so mad? And there is something kind of aggressive about the new strains of weed that I do see. Because everybody, when they in 2020, when they were all marching and protesting and rioting and looting, whatever form that was, everyone really just wanted to get out and smoke weed together. It was like yeah. huge, just weed festivals. And everybody was kind of partying at these things. And there, yeah, was, and was-, there was this same element in our post-October 7th as well. Yeah, so I think in I, I think you're absolutely right. 2020 was a huge turning point in all this mad politics, because it, it, well, firstly, it, it's worth remembering that it was the lockdown. So we had the COVID lockdown. Everyone yeah. was locked up. Um, in Britain, we were allowed to go out once a day, uh, and that was it. It was crazy, and I'm sure there were similar situations in various American states. So. Part of that response to George Floyd was an explosion of all that pent up lockdown anger and frustration and resentment. So they just, people just burst onto the streets and said, we're back, you know, we're back in the public square. And uh, yeah. even, if, even if we're burning things down, at least we're out, at least we're outdoors. That was essentially the, the sentiment. Uh, but it was like 2020 and that Floyd moment, that was when all the identitarian crap that's been gathering pace for some time really took on a very physical form. So do you remember mm-hmm. when there would be there would be mobs of kids on the streets of New York or other American cities and they would be harassing white diners and saying to white people, <laughs> you know, ap- ap- apologize for slavery, you honky, all this really crazy <laughs> stuff. And it was like um and there were I saw clips of white people bowing down and begging black people for forgiveness. I mean, it was washing repulsive. their feet. Washing Remember their those feet? videos? It was no. We've, it was religious we've hysteria. Also, it was. We've also. I have not forgotten this because we documented it all on Dumpster Fire, and so <laughs> I have it all on every episode. Yeah. We were. I was like, what? It truly is like Douglas Murray wrote the madness of crowds. Yeah, and it was a wild time. Remember the celebrities when they had that video and they were apologizing for racism? Unbelievable. And they were like, I apologize. I mean, it was such a that all the all the emails I was getting from corporations. And I've said this yeah. so many times when they're like, we apologize for our, I'm like, well, I didn't think you were racist until <laughs> yeah. you started apologizing for it. Yeah. And now I have some questions. Yeah. Um, I, was, it was, it was, it was delirious. It was really, really, it, it was like our societies were in the grip of a genuine medieval style hysteria. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of the dancing plague, but in in Europe in the 1500s and the 1600s, there was a dancing plague. <laughs> you, you, should go, you should go to the Wikipedia page. It's the funniest Wikipedia page in existence. But and this reminds me of the TikTok dances from yeah. the freaking nurses. <laughs> but, it, but the dancing plague in medieval Europe is when large groups of people would start dancing for no obvious reason, and they would die. They would die from dancing. I know. They would just dance nonstop I until they, they would collapsed. dance until they died. And it, it, that kind of reminded, when I <laughs> saw what was happening in the 2020s, because do you remember there was all the, firstly, there was all the nurses and doctors who kept yeah. dancing. And you That's think what I mean, the, the TikTok, TikTok dances. And you think to yourself, aren't you supposed to be saving the lives of all these people who are dying? And um, and then it gave way to um, the BLM stuff and the riots, and and we had some of that in the UK at, at a much smaller scale, and that involved partying and dancing as well, and people really going quite hardcore, and it was just hysterical. But you know, it, I, I Douglas Murray's phrase, "the madness of crowds." I often think fundamentally, this is the madness of the elites because this stuff went right to the very top of society. So the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is the head of the Church of England, he responded to the George Floyd thing by saying, um, we need to have an audit of every church and cathedral in England to make sure that there's no monuments or statues or paintings that in any way praise the slavery era or the colonial era. So basically, he ordered an exorcism of the churches of Britain. He ordered a, 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 the destruction. It was like the 
the French Revolution all over again, although this time it was being done by Christians to themselves, the mm. destruction of any monument that might have made a positive nod to crimes of history. And, and the British Museum here did the same thing, and the Natural History Museum. They hid away certain artifacts. They There was even a discussion about covering up the statue of Charles Darwin at the Natural History Museum because he was on a colonial ship. It, it, mm. it, you know, the hysteria went right to the top of society. And it, it there was a few months in 2020, really from March through to June or July, where I thought America and Britain have gone so mad, I'm not sure we can come back from this. And and I guess since then, it's all of those tensions have been bubbling up in one way or another in, in different uh, areas of society. I'm not sure we can come back. I, I, mm. it, because like you said, it is there is this kind of you know, I was joking about this on Dumpster Fire where it's like there's the kind of academic commies and then the street commies kind of do their bidding. And you never really know what you're going to unleash with the with the with uh, you you get in these kind of ideological bubbles. You talk about all and you see this on the right as well, Well, they'll, where they'll be talking about like, oh, IQ and blood, all the like yeah. brain yeah. side, all this other crap. And yeah. then it gets funneled down to something like white power or or white supremacy and on on you see the same thing on the left happening with the like racism and particularly around jews where it's like oh we were joking about this when i was in new york i was at a dinner and everybody kept saying like oh the zion i'm like just say jews yeah. stop yeah. saying zionists <laughs> like just yeah. say jews you guys just stop using your weird code word just say what yeah. you are yeah. actually at least be honest about what you're talking about yeah and I, it, I, it gets funneled down to like you like you point out in your book now there's like why do you why would you think that saying these little things like globalize the um intifada and and all of their other mantras would wh why would you think that wouldn't be translated into oh let's go you know s burn some jewish things businesses down yeah absolutely you know um the horseshoe I, i've always thought the horseshoe theory is a bit too easy but actually when it comes to anti-jewish racism it makes a lot of sense because mm. that's coming now from the left and the right totally. so on the left you know on the left you have this anti-zionism which is just anti-semitism you know just be honest fellas we know what you're talking about i got <laughs> i got a message via just instagram <laughs> yeah just say Jew. i got a i got a message on instagram a few months ago from this guy saying uh how much are the jews paying you to say all this crap and i <laughs> I, I I hardly ever message people back, but I was probably drunk. So I messaged him back saying, I'm sorry, but I block racists. And then he responded to me saying, I'm not racist. I meant to say, how much is Israel paying you? I didn't mean to say, how much are the Jews paying you? And I thought it was such a perfect <laughs> moment of the mask slipping where he accidentally <laughs> said Jew instead of Israel or instead of Zionist. And it, yeah. that happens a lot as well. But then so you have that on the left, you have this obsession with Zionism, which really is an obsession with Jewish power. And then on the mm -hmm. right, because you have this new online right, which I find so horrible and repulsive because they've re-embraced old forms of racial thinking as well. And they think black people are inferior to white people. They think Jews are puppeteering everything, including mass immigration. They think there's this theory online now amongst right-wing nutters that Jewish people are masterminding mass immigration in order to weaken the white race and replace us with blacks. I mean, that that's, uh, and this is not a, a small group of people. This is becoming mm -hmm. uh, not a mainstream theory, but it's becoming a fairly widespread theory. So mm -hmm. you have this pincer movement where both the far left and the far right have returned to this middle ground of Jew hatred, and they blame Jews for everything. The left blames Jewish people for the ills of capitalism, and the right blames Jewish people for resuscitating communism. You know, it's this weird phenomenon where whichever side you look at, especially on the crankier sections of the internet, you're going to find some Jew hatred. There's no question about it. 
Yeah, and it does seem like no, they are the like most ancient scapegoat. It yeah. just no matter. It's like you're too poor, you're too rich. You, I yeah. always think about being in Prague with our Jewish tour guide showing us the ghettos, talking about how during the plagues they were in the ghettos and they had better just sanitation practices because they were all in a ghetto. So they took a lot of their waste out and they handled things better. And because of that, they didn't suffer the plague. And so then they got blamed for the plague. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> it's just it, it's, it's like, oh, they don't have the plague. And obviously it's not because yeah, we have oh. shit in our streets <laughs> yeah. and we're dumping buckets of feces into our water supply. It's yeah. because of the Jews. Yeah, it's because of the Jews. Of course, it has to be. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's I think one of the points I make in my book is that um, in the past, Jews were seen as being insufficiently white. You know, they were an right. inferior race, and now they're seen as being too white. So, yep. one thing you will hear from pretty mainstream left wing voices, you will hear them talk about um, the hyper whiteness of Jewish people, the white privilege that Jewish people enjoy. And I want to say to them, why don't you just say Jewish privilege? At least that's what the online Nazis say. You know, just be honest. Mm -hmm. so you've got. The left wring in their hands over white privilege or hyper white privilege, which often is just a reference to Jewish people, successful Jewish communities. And on the right, you, on the right, you have people talking about Jewish privilege, and there's an unholy marriage between those two points of view. But it's, it, it's. I think one of the points I try to draw out is that whenever anti-Semitism rears its head in a society that's always a good sign that that society has lost its way throughout mm -hmm. history you know racism kind of comes and goes and misogyny comes and goes and these things are always around but anti-semitism in particular is always a marker for a society going off the rails it is it, 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 when when that hatred returns and that scapegoating returns then there's a sickness in the air and i think that's kind of what's happening now that yeah, I, I think I had Brett Stevens on a long time ago, and he said something to that effect of it's like the immune system of humanity. And yeah. when anti Semitism flares up, it's like a, an immune response to a society that's sick. Yeah. And it's it's usually also precedes a world war. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. not great. <laughs> um, <laughs> but maybe that's the only way to kind of purge, get through this. Because when you when I ask people, you know, what what happens here? And it's usually, well, we probably need some hard times in a war, truly, to I don't I don't really know how you find your way out of this. It's it. Uh, it doesn't yeah. seem like it's improving. It's not that um, I'm encouraging that or want that, but it, it does. I don't know how, I don't know how this situation, like how does the mind that created this fix the problem? Yeah. It reminds me of the, on the Simpsons, Bart Simpson was watching TV and there was a bunch of idiot teenagers protesting about something. And he said, we need a new Vietnam to thin out their ranks a little bit. And I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say we need a new Vietnam to thin out the ranks of all the annoying 20 year olds on, on, on university campuses. But I do think if people had to struggle for things and maybe, or, or at least recognize that life is a bit of a struggle, not everyone lives in extraordinary leafy luxury on the com the campuses of Columbia or Harvard or any of these other places you know not everyone has the luxury of the coastal elites with their luxury beliefs and their luxury lives you know there are people out there who are struggling and who have to fight for their existence and and this does come back to the Israel question because i i just find this kind of haughty indignation amongst privileged Westerners, when they look at Israel fighting a war for its survival, and they look down their noses and they say, oh my God, how dare you fire missiles at Hamas? How, you know, why are you, why are you firing missiles at Hezbollah? Completely ignoring the fact that Israel has been under attack by those two groups for a whole year and under really severe attack, and also failing to recognize that sometimes, uh, and I made this point to Joe Rogan when I was on his show a few months ago, Sometimes a society has to fight for itself. Sometimes the right. young people in a society have to be called upon to defend their fellow citizens from the threat posed by foreign armies. And, right. and that's one of the things I think it's, you know, 
there is this obsession, obsessive hatred for Israel, which powers a lot of the modern left. But I think part of it is that they just don't understand that sometimes you've got to fight for your country. And because we've not had to do that in the West for a very, very long time, you, there aren't many people alive who can remember the last time ordinary people in the West had to fight like that. It's become a distant memory. It's become an ancient memory, and and it's become something from the history books. So when people have to do it in the here and now, and I think Israel has to do it, there is this kind of really sniffy indignation, and I I, I find that creepy and unpleasant. Yeah, more, the problem too is that the people who would be fighting in this war, the men, young men, are not the ones who have been captured by this ideology yeah. and are creating these problems. Those kids, generally children of privilege who are on universities, would probably be exempt from it for some, you know, dis disability that they yeah. have, like mental illness, Asperger's or whatever, you know, <laughs> like they would find yeah. a way out or their parents would find them a way out. And that's what that is what bothers me the most is that if we are headed to this, some kind of war, and I and this is where I do understand, because the the young 20 something men are doing a pretty good job of thinning themselves out just yeah. deaths of despair. Mm. And fentanyl overdoses and depression and suicide and these you know this the new online right that has this kind of isolation in america that has arisen that has an isolationist like we don't care about israel what are we doing over in ukraine i do understand that a lot of these these are kids of people who went to war in the Middle East and have parents who came back and were like, well, fuck that. Yeah. That was a, that was a stupid and pointless. And we were lied to about why we even went in there. And a lot of the young kids who went after 9-11 were like completely disillusioned. And they're not passing on the same kind of pride in the army that my great my that my grandfather had when he came back from world war ii i just had a psychiatrist on dr david pewter and he was talking about how um really world war ii was one of the last wars where they came home heroes and after that all the soldiers have all come back and they were spit on from vietnam and they were treated horribly so this i do understand the kind of that weird tension of like, well, we're not going to, why should we sacrifice our young people who they're not even the ones who are, are feeling this way. And now there's, yeah, it's, it's very complicated. You know, I, I, I yeah. can like understand where people don't understand that they have to defend their civilization. And actually I yeah. think these guys are generally more pro America, pro West but also isol now you're seeing that kind of isolationism occurring you know it's it, there's a real culture of war weariness in the west i, I you mm -hmm. see it all the time and I, I i see it when i speak to american friends of mine and i see it when i speak to british friends of mine there's a sense because so many of the wars we fought over the past 20 years or so have been completely bullshit wars you know mm -hmm. why the hell would, did we go into iraq it was built on it was a tissue of lies you know saddam hussein did not have wmd he was not capable of bombing london in 45 minutes which is what we were told um yep. it was just nonsense and a lot of young primarily working class men went over yep. there and gave gave their lives for a lie and that is and then they came back and all the kind of upper middle class men who would never go to war because they're not capable and they don't want to w were calling them criminals and murderers mm -hmm, and, and pieces mm -hmm. of shit you know it, it that's pr profoundly unpleasant and and dispiriting i think for people who might originally have wanted to do something for their country and then they get treated in this way both by the army and by the kind of intelligentsia it's, it's really unpleasant but it's like um it you know I'm not a warmongering type. I, I'm not a pacifist, but I also don't think war is is brilliant. It's it's necessary sometimes, but it's not great. Um, but I do sometimes worry that our societies are increasingly incapable of fighting a war, which could land us in hot water sometime in the future. You know, mm -hmm. 
because you have this situation where the upper middle classes are not going to fight a war firstly because they're all anti-war secondly because they're all pathetic and weak and um you know they're all gender fluid and they're very thin and, and pale and <laughs> they're all on ozempic um, now they're all they have on, no they're bone all, density yeah. they're all on the Zempic. <laughs> or they're, they're all obese <laughs> oh yeah and they're all on the spectrum and they're <laughs> It's like um, Camille Pallier made this point that, you know, we have young people in the West who are myopically obsessing over where they fit on the gender ruler while ISIS is coming to Europe and blowing up our children. And she said yeah. that about 10 years ago, and it was absolutely true. It was exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. and it, was, it was a bit like the end of the Roman Empire where you had – um, you know, the emperors and all their family sitting around eating grapes and, and playing violins while the barbarians were at the gates and climbing over them and, and raping and pillaging Rome. Uh, it, right. It's not as extreme as that, but it does feel like a long drawn out process that is not entirely dissimilar, where we do have these global threats. And I think radical islamism is one of those global threats but we live in societies that are increasingly incapable of being honest about those threats and incapable of producing the tough young people who might be able to stand up to them if push comes to shove so that i think sometimes maybe it's because i'm getting a bit older but sometimes i do think to myself that's a bit of a concern if we don't have strong masculine men and also masculine women, which I don't think is a contradiction in terms. If we don't have those sections of society who are willing to stand up for society, then we could be in trouble at some point. Mm -hmm. If you love Vox and Welcome, please consider becoming a subscriber to Phetasy.com to show your support. Phetasy relies on its supporters to continue creating the content you love. So if you can, please support us. It truly keeps the lights on and the content churning. Churning? And it keeps me going. <laughs> you also get a multitude of exclusive subscriber content. So come join us. Go check it out. Phetasy.com. P-H-E-T-A-S-Y.com. It's funny how the... The, the October 7th really broke the world in a way that I don't, you know, it's going to play out for a long, long time. Broke brains. Yeah. What One of the criticisms I got most often in my DMs from people was that I just didn't care about brown people. This mm -hmm. is something I heard. I didn't care that the bombs were raining down on brown people. And I value Jewish life more than I value Palestinian life. And I I felt like that was unfair because it feels like people who were cheering Hamas and their actions were also cheering for whatever devastation would occur in Gaza. Yeah. Like I'm like I I'm not cheering for this but what are you, what are they supposed to do exactly? You, it it feels so the amount of restraint that Israel is is required to um, you know, try and in war, <laughs> like it's yeah. just like you have to be just like restraining your. They're the. It's crazy to me that that's demanded of them, and they often do a pretty good job, from what I can tell, from what experts have said, and being as surgical, trying to minimize, co you know, human costs. But um, what do you what do you think? What what do you hear? What criticisms do you hear when you are with? I think if you came out of this with any moral clarity, you were accused of, um, you know, a being a Jew lover or whatever, working, yeah. getting paid by it. I'm like, they're clearly not paying me very well then <laughs> um, <laughs> or nothing. Yeah. And and um, what what is your kind of answer to that? Do you hear that criticism? Oh, yeah. All the time. You know, if you're pro Israel or you say anything that even hints that Israel has got the right to push back against Hamas for what it did on the 7th of October, you'll just be accused of being not only pro-war, but anti-Arab. You know, you're an anti-Arab right. racist. You don't give a shit about Palestinian life. You don't care about Palestinian women and children. Um, I mean, it's just for me, and I'm sure for you and many other people, it's just not true. And in fact, one of the reasons I hated 7th of October when it happened 
um, is not only because it laid waste to so many Jewish lives in Israel, uh, civilians, raped, kidnapped, butchered, really awful stuff, but also because I knew what was going to happen next. I knew there was going to be a mm -hmm. war and I knew that loads of Palestinians were going to die. It was completely and utterly inevitable. Hamas knew it was going to happen. Iran knew it was going to happen. We all knew it was going to happen. So the carnival of killing was going to carry on. And it's Hamas's fault because they started a war that they shouldn't have started. And they're now refusing to end the war by surrendering to Israel and returning the hostages. So Hamas is dragging this out. And Hamas leaders openly say that the more martyrs they can create, the more favor they will win around the world, the more that they will embarrass Israel. So there's actually this really grotesque symbiotic relationship between the activist class in the West, which craves these images of Palestinian suffering, they they love images of Palestinian suffering. They share them all day long. The most grotesque images of, of bodies and people with missing heads and really horrible stuff. They share them all day long with no consideration whatsoever for the privacy or the dignity of the families involved. They don't care about mm -hmm. that. All they care about is using these images to uh, signify their own virtue and their own mm -hmm. capacity to care about foreigners and their own capacity to care about brown people. And the more that you have this situation where, you know, these various institutions in the West love to see images of Palestinian suffering because it boosts their sense of self, the more Hamas will be willing to provide those images. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why Hamas leaders openly say that um, if we have more Palestinian martyrs, it will be beneficial to our cause because that's how they relate to, that's how they have their impact on the world through suffering, through pain, through destitution. So, you know, who who is it that doesn't care about Arab life? Is it those of us who desperately want the war to come to an end by the surrender of Hamas and the return of the Jewish hostages? Or is it these weirdos around the West, these woke weirdos who get some strange moral kick from the continued pain of the Palestinian people. I just, you know, I, I want the war to stop. I don't want a single Israeli to die or a single Palestinian to die or a single Arab to die. I want the whole thing to come to an end. But I also recognize that it can't come to an end while Hamas remains fully armed and keeps threatening to carry out more 7th of Octobers. What kind of lunatic nation would allow such an army to live on its border? It's just unreasonable to make that request, I think, off, off the Jewish state. What do you make of, you know, do you know Dave Smith? He has a part no. of the problem. Um, he's been around. He, he, he kind of, he, he makes the argument that Netanyahu, you know, kind of appease Hamas and what do you make of these these arguments that 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 Net Netanyahu kind of knowingly made this worse I've had pe friends who have basically become 9-11 truthers in the wake of October 7th because mm. they feel like that was something that was allowed and why couldn't that have been the case in America friends and family members yeah it's um you know, I've heard this argument so many times. I think it's probably true that Netanyahu or some element in the Israeli state thought it might be vaguely in their interest to boost the radical Islamist wing of Palestinian politics in order to weaken the old secular wing of Palestinian politics, which is the the PLO and Fatah, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, you know, it, it would not be the first time in history that the leader of a nation sought to play off his enemies against each other. I mean, that's as old as history and war itself. Um, so that could be true. But the thing that worries me about arguments like that is that it actually absolves groups like Hamas of of responsibility for what they do. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, people make this argument with Al-Qaeda. People will always say that, well, you know, America and Britain supported the Mujahideen in the Afghanistan war in the 1980s. And that's absolutely true. Uh, America and Britain armed these radical Islamists because they were fighting against the Soviet Union and it was in our interest for them to defeat the Soviet Union. Um, but and and bin laden was there and some al qaeda leaders were there and they may have benefited from american support for a brief period of time etc cetera, etc cetera. but you can't then blame america for everything al qaeda does subsequently you can't right. then say it's america's fault that osama bin laden and his colleagues took the independent conscious decision to 
kill 3,000 American citizens. Because this that creates this really weird argument where you only see Western powers as adult actors in world affairs, and everyone else, especially Arabs in this case, are just these kind of puppets who are led one way or another by forces more powerful than themselves. There's a kind of underhand, unwitting racism to some of these arguments, mm -hmm. because you're essentially mm -hmm. saying uh, mighty America and mighty Israel must be behind everything, because these idiots in, in Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Palestine, they're not capable of, of evil. And you know, a, a point I've made a few times over the past few years is it, it is racist to say that all Muslims are evil. Of course it is. And you will hear that argument from, from sections of the online right. It's racist to say that. But it's also racist to say that Muslims are incapable of evil and that mm -hmm. unlike us white folk, they don't have the same capacity for wrongdoing or they don't have the same capacity for terrorism. And therefore, we always have to go and look for the American origins to where they came from or the Israeli origins or the British origins. There's a, there's a racial judgment in that as well. So I think my argument in relation to 7th of October is I don't care what Netanyahu might or might not have done with these Palestinian groups in the past. I care about Hamas's own decision to execute one of the worst acts of fascist violence in 80 years. And, and, and that's on them. That's not on anyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a, there's a couple of things that come up. One, I felt the same way in the wake of Believe All Women, you know, that the, it felt very infantilizing, like, oh, these poor women, they, yeah. they just like, they don't have the capacity to lie or be, <laughs> or be human at all. They just, uh, they, we just need to believe everything they say. There's no, nothing duplicitous or shady about women. And yeah. I, that always bothered me the, yeah. the, from the get-go. And the other thing that I was thinking when you were talking about this is the, the victim blaming, you know, that we, we've ha heard so much about don't victim blame, don't victim blame, don't victim blame. And in this instance, it feels like just the supreme act of victim blaming this entire nation and its people for an act that was done to them. And yeah. even like, oh, they're like, when when people, you know, there were a lot of mainstream journalists were like, where are all the women now? Yeah. I'm like, you guys, they abandoned us a while ago. The feminists abandoned women a long time ago. I've been, I was writing about this years ago. They abandoned us to men in women's prisons and in yep. women's sports. So if you're surprised that they're suddenly abandoning Jewish women after they're being raped, I, I have a bridge to sell you. <laughs> this is not something that should be surprising, but it was surprising. Uh, on on the like i don't know when it came to like the kids and the tearing down the kidnapping posters and yeah. putting feces on them and defacing yeah. them that is such an insane act of violence in and of itself just of a, a, a violent of like we're yeah. the i think i tweeted this like we're the good guys they screamed as they ripped apart a pic picture of a three-year-old hostage that's, I, I'm yeah. I mean, that how do was, you tell yourself that? You know, that was the moment that I, I talk in the book about. Um, I think the moment at which I thought, okay, the response to this pogrom is going to be even worse than I thought it would be, and I thought it would be pretty mm. bad. It's when I saw everywhere I went in London for a period of time, you would see these post the remains of these posters. You would see the claw marks on these posters where people had just launched a frenzied attack on them and tried to rip them down. And there was one poster of three-year-old twins. Three-year-old twins were kidnapped by Hamas. They were later let go. There was a poster of those twins in London and someone drew Hitler moustaches on them. And you think to yourself, you just think, uh, to me, that was it was one of the sickest things I've seen in, in London in a long time. And it, what, it did feel like a violent act because this was the graffitiing of literal toddlers, you know, not even children, just toddlers, very, very small kids. Um, the graffitiing of them with fascist 
insignia, you know, essentially mm. saying these kids are the real fascists, not not the militants who kidnapped them, but these ch these children, they're the fascists. It was unbelievably gross. It was unimaginably gross. And there was a lot of those kinds of things happening. And in one poster, in, I think in New York, as you say, was covered in shit. You just yeah. think, you know, what is this madness? What What is driving this madness? And I think, you know, in relation to um, the feminism thing, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Anyone who was shocked that feminists have abandoned women um, needs to have their head checked. And I really agree about <laughs> I really agree about the Me Too stuff because I think it was Margaret Atwood who said that there's misogyny in this idea that all women are angels. You know, yes. of course, we all know there's misogyny in the idea that all women are sluts or all all women are good for is cooking food. We know there's misogyny in that. But I think it was her who said there's also misogyny in the idea that women are spotless, blameless, angelic figures who never lie, never do anything wrong, never use their uh, wiliness or, or anything else to, to get their way. There's the misogyny in that as well, because it, mm. it treats them as morally inferior to men. They don't enjoy mm -hmm. the same moral capacity as men do for deceit or mm -hmm. uh, one-upmanship or self-interest, you know, those things that men can do, but apparently women can't. But, you know, there was a moment during Me Too when I was reading about all those cases, and there was one case where a comedian, I think, masturbated in front of some women. I can't remember who it was. You you might remember. And Louis C.K. Louis C.K. And I, I remember reading that, and I, and I thought, can I say this out loud? But I just thought, why didn't they walk out of the room? And I know that I, I, I've heard all the arguments about power dynamics and he was the famous comedian and these ladies weren't particularly famous and so on. And he, they were enamored by him, et cetera, et cetera. I get all that. I understand that. And, and I have some sympathy with it, but they could have walked out of the room. They could have mm -hmm. turned their backs on his ungentlemanly gross behavior and walked away. And I think saying that is, in my view, a, a greater blow for sexual equality than what actually happened, which was the depiction of all these women as completely hapless creatures who couldn't do anything at all to get out of those kinds it's of situations. Like Fucking bullshit, too, because <laughs> I've lived in Hollywood and I've been in Park City, Utah, and I've been in the wealthy areas where the beautiful women are in San Tropez, and I know how women use their power. I mean, yeah. it is it is not to act. It is infuriating to me to act like women don't have power at, yeah. at, when I yeah. have wielded that power. I've written about <laughs> using that power. I've written about weaponizing my sexuality to a, a point that is unhealthy for men and women. I mean, this yeah. is, this is, this is one of the oldest and, and you're right. There is misogyny in that idea that women are kind of so pure and angelic. And I think it is, it, it even gets tied to why men are kind of excused for like, well, they just have to sow their wild oats and have affairs yeah. and, you know, women will be stoned or killed or, I mean, this is the other thing too, and it's just a tangent, but in America, we have all this conversation about like the trans genocide of like nine people. <laughs> and it's, and meanwhile, women are killed in massive numbers by partners or former partners every day in America, yeah. all the time. And where's that conversation? Where, where, why don't we care about those women? Usually you know, because they're lower class, yeah. usually because they're not, if they're middle class, it's the same thing with the rape gangs in the UK. It was all yeah. like white, middle and lower class women that this was happening to. Yeah, it's um, absolutely right. There's such a, you know, one of the reasons that feminists, feminism has betrayed women is because feminism largely became an upper class movement. Yes. It became a movement for it, through which largely upper class women could pursue their own interests, including their own class interests, which was to be in the boardroom and to have uh, an equal share to power in, in big business. And fine, I, of course, I think women should be equal in the workplace, including the business world. But it was the means through which, you know, the girl boss sections of womankind could pursue their own class interests. And they completely forgot about women everywhere else who have very different interests. And you know, it's it's why I've always had an issue with a feminist argument that women are a sex class, because mm. 
I've always struggled with that argument and I get so much flack from feminists for my criticisms of it, but I'm sorry, but women aren't a sex class. And the woman who cleans Apple's offices might be an immigrant woman, but very badly paid who works late at night cleaning their offices. I'm sorry, but she's not the same class as the women who run Apple and the mm -hmm. women who have the big jobs there and the women who get paid the big bucks and leave at 4 p.m. and go home to their big house. Th these women are not in the same class. They are different classes. Mm -hmm. And lumping them all together, I think, just kind of confuses the different issues that impact on people differently. But it's, um, you know, in relation to uh, the 7th of October, the fallout from the 7th of October, I, I mentioned this in the book, but one of the most telling moments is in the month that the UN finally the UN finally published this report saying women were abused on 7th of October. It took them months and months to do it, but they eventually did it and they got the evidence together. In that same week, feminists in Britain were fighting for their right to go to the Garrick Club. Now, the Garrick Club, for American listeners, is this opulent men-only club in central London where very, very powerful men from King Charles down go to have a glass of wine on a Friday or whatever. And, and it's only for men. It's one of those archaic men only clubs. And these feminists were fighting for their right to go into this palatial club in central London and quaff champagne with powerful people. While women in Gaza were chained to radiators, while mm -hmm. Jewish women were being abused and shot in the head by their captors mm -hmm. and sexually mm -hmm. assaulted. And I just thought this is such a brilliant and repulsive illustration of the dangers of virtue signaling, where you become so obsessed with signaling your own virtue, in this case, your virtuous quest to become a member of the Garrick, that you forget about everything else, including what was at that point the worst instance of sexual degradation taking place in the world, which was the kidnapping and and. Uh, abuse of these young women from Israel. So, mm -hmm. you know, feminism's betrayals of women have been gathering pace for some time, but I think after 7th of October, it just became undeniable for most people. Some, so much of why the, you know, I was realizing because this anti-Semitism on the left has been festering for a long time. And I was terrified of the aftermath because I had I, again, it's something I'd written about. And I think it's part of the thing that when I really look back at not to be like, oh, the left lost me. Um, but <laughs> when I look back at <laughs> I, I just like every slogan, I hate every slogan, but there yeah. are, it is like I was saying the other day, it's also like AA or 12 step where they're like, <laughs> they're true. Like, go woke, go yeah. broke makes me want to blow my brains out. But it's also true. And um, yeah, the, this was something that I feel when I started becoming aware of it, it was something where I was like, oh, I, I no longer identify with whatever is happening on the progressive left like I did before. Yeah, And that was one of the biggest signs to me was that, I mean, I remember this. I remember this from when there was a outbreak of, uh, something happened in Israel between Israel and Palestine. There was a kind of outbreak of anti-Jewish sentiment in the cities and a family member. I was telling a family member about it because a lot of my friends were living in the neighborhood where they were kind of going like around getting beat up by, in this case, African-American people. And a family member on the East Coast was like, oh, is it because of the white supremacists who are beating people up. I was like, <laughs> I, I don't have enough time to unpack this with you, but like, no, there aren't white supremacists running around LA beating up Jews. But right. I understand you wouldn't know that because <laughs> while this has also been happening in Brooklyn for years, it is never reported yeah. ever. I mean, yeah. there had been violence against Jews in Brooklyn for for like bad incidents of it and you if you didn't have twitter you basically wouldn't hear about it yeah it's you know no one wants to talk about black anti-semitism no one wants to talk right. about it especially the left and now i'm not saying all black people Pandas. are anti-semitic no, i'm just kidding right you know <laughs> um but no one and 
it's the same with Muslim anti-Semitism in Europe. You're not allowed to talk about it. And Muslim anti-Semitism mm. in, Europe, in Europe is a big problem. It really right. is a big problem, uh, you know, in terms of violent acts, but also opinion polls always find that there are significant numbers of Muslims in European countries who have a, a, a derogatory take on Jewish people. It's just a fact. But you're not allowed to talk about it. And we've now reached a situation where it's, it's Islamophobic to talk about anti-Semitism. Mm. <laughs> and it's racist to talk about anti-Semitism. And you just think, how have we arrived in this situation? And I think it is... I think it is in large part down to the politics of identity and all this identitarian oh, right. crap that the left has embraced. Because um, what the politics of identity does, it, it doesn't just say, listen, we need a reckoning with our racist history and, and so on and so forth. It actually organizes races according to their moral worth. So you're either from mm. a privileged race or you're from a, an oppressed race. So you're either from a race that deserves uh, disdain and must be forced to apologize for the sins of history and must always atone for everything that went wrong. And that, that includes white people, Jewish people, you know, the privileged races, or you're from an oppressed race like African Americans or Muslim communities in Europe. And therefore you deserve sympathy. You deserve resources. You deserve our, our support, etc. So it, it brings back to life a kind of very subtle form of segregation where people races are segregated according to what these people consider to be their moral worth are they privileged and thus bad or are they oppressed and thus good and when you have that system of racial judgment um the jews are always going to lose out because mm. it's not a uniform phenomenon but jewish immigrants tend to be relatively successful they are a pretty driven immigrant community for various historical reasons. Um, it's the same with other communities as well. So, for example, if you look in the UK, African immigrants, so black kids born to African parents, do incredibly well at school. They do incredibly well in university, whereas for various reasons to do with family breakdown and, and lack of fathers, et cetera, um, black kids from Afro-Caribbean families do worse. So mm -hmm. you always see these differences, but um, because Jews in the West at least are mostly white and often successful, they lose out most of all as a result of this identitarian hierarchy. They're always at the top, which means they're always the people who get the most um, abuse. So it, it, on the left, this kind of new anti-Semitism has been gathering pace for some time, but it's an anti-Semitism that masquerades as anti-racism. And that what that's what makes it really difficult to unpick, because at least the fascists of the past were pretty open about the fact that they were racist. What we have now are um, people who have embraced anti-Semitic thinking, but they call themselves anti-racist. And that makes it quite mm. difficult to challenge them. I don't know. I don't know where I I don't know where we go from here truly. I think I think I spend a lot of time talking to people about this and thinking about this and I'm grateful for people who seem to have some moral clarity on, on it and your ability to articulate a lot of the hypocrisy around in particular this it, it is just you're like why is it always why why is it anti racist and why why is it when it's jews none of those things apply yeah exactly <laughs> and then Absolutely. you're like it's cuz they're jews like yeah. there's no other explanation i don't yeah. know what the i am a not i i can't find another explanation yeah. because it, it everything else it does not make it's not logically coherent there's not that I expect that from the people who will tell you that men can get pregnant, but I do, I do, <laughs> I do. I, I would hope that they would apply all of their, you know, like the mental gymnastics you have to do to exclude people who have been historically persecuted throughout yeah. all of time. Yeah. And in this instance is pretty wild. And I really don't know what else to attribute it to other than maybe uh, like the thing that worries me too, is that, and I was having this conversation with some Jewish friends because they know what anti-Semitism is. They are 
taught about anti-Semitism. Yeah. They experience it. They learn about the history of it. They know the tropes. They know, like, why are the Christians disappear? You know, they understand this. Most Americans in particular, I don't think know that many Jews. Mm. Maybe they know one. If if you're in a city, you probably know more. But the average American in a small town or in a and I don't think they know that many. And I don't know how much historical knowledge really anyone has. And I'll have people in my life that I love and respect send me these very obvious anti-Semitic yeah. tropes disguised as, well, we're just asking questions. Yeah. And it's like, I yeah. have to be like, guys, this is anti-Semitism. And it's like, yeah. well, they don't know. And that's what worries me is that now you have with like reels and memes and just asking questions, these, these, these things that are historically thousand year old tropes about Jews being spread under, under the guise of just TikToks, reels and, <laughs> and people who are just two people who really don't know and don't even know that what they're actually ingesting is a very um, insidious, ancient form of anti-Semitism. I don't know how you yeah. combat that. I just think, well, calling it out <laughs> to use a, a woke phrase is is definitely the first step. But I I couldn't agree more. All of the ancient anti-Semitic tropes are coming back. They often get dressed up as anti-Zionist tropes these days. But it's the same right. thing. So on just all these, say Jew. Uh, yeah, I'm on make all that these T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> on all these marches in London and New York, you'll often see people say the Zionists control the media. And you think, mm -hmm. come on, just say Jew, mm -hmm. just be mm -hmm. honest. Or they just will say, say they say that uh, America and Britain are uh, eating out of the hand of Israel, which is exactly what the Nazis said. They said the Jewish people controlled the world, controlled world politics, controlled the banks. It's the same old shit, but it's just been given a little, a little bit of spit and polish with the Z. A word. glow up. <laughs> yeah, glow up, right? The, gl the glow, glow up of up. racial <laughs> hatred. But it's like... Um, but you do, you do, I do sometimes think to myself, you know, how have we ended up in a situation where students at Columbia, not to pick on Columbia, but students at Columbia who would consider themselves the most progressive people in the world are saying to Jews, fuck off back to Poland. Or, yeah. you know, there was one case at Columbia where one of the student activists held up a sign that said, you're next. You're, you're Hamas's next target. And she pointed the sign at a bunch of Jewish kids. Um, there was a placard in the middle of the encampment at, at Columbia, which described Israel as the pigs of the earth. Now, if anyone wants to tell me that that's anti-Zionism, I tell you what, I'll, I'll punch their lights out because we know what, if you're referring to Israel as the pigs of the earth, and if you're harassing Jewish students, that's anti-Semitism. That's all it is. That's yeah. racism. And you know, in the in the moment, because we live in 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 a moment of moral cowardice, where so few people are willing are willing to call this stuff out or to name it for what it is, it looks like everyone's getting away with it. It looks like everyone's getting away with the madness. But but the optimist in me thinks that in twenty years' time, when we come to write the history of this moment, future historians will be dumbfounded that open anti-Semitism returned to campuses like Columbia and Harvard. They will be dumbfounded that lesbians had their breasts cut off and they were given drugs to turn them into men. They will be dumbfounded that our societies that you know our societies were in the grip of such hysteria that white people bow bow down and kiss the feet of black people. I really do the optimist in me thinks that at the moment people treat this crap as normal. But in the future, people are going to say, what happened then? What happened in the early 2020s that created such a racist, anti-Semitic climate and such a homophobic climate where mm. young gay kids were being drugged and surgically um, castrated or mm -hmm. having their bodies reordered by doctors because mm -hmm. they were seen as having some inner sickness? You know, how, how did societies lose their way that much? I genuinely mm -hmm. think in, at some point, other people will start to ask those questions as well. I mean, I hope so. I hope so. It <laughs> seems a little bit like it's happening. I, I see a yeah, lot of pushback 
it it does seem but i don't know if it isn't um it might be too late <laughs> 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 I mean, I feel late. like Europe is lost. You know, the the Europe seems very lost to me. And but yeah, maybe we're finished. It's over <laughs> for UK us. in particular. Um, yeah. Good luck for you. And you don't have free speech, so you no. guys are fucked. Um, <laughs> Canada's lost. Australia seems lost. All all of your colonies are lost. Uh, I don't know. It does it does worry me just seeing just seeing that i think about like these i see it even around trump i was recently right in the aftermath of his near assassination you had so many people people i know who will openly at dinner parties be talking about how oh you know too bad it was only like an inch you know oh. too bad it missed and i'm like you feel comfortable saying that this is like feeling comfortable about ripping up a poster of a child being held hostage yeah. by terrorists yeah you feel perfectly comfortable in polite company <laughs> expressing your inner sociopath i guess like <laughs> yeah. that you are okay with somebody being murdered yeah. on a live broadcast which would by the way traumatize children everybody who would have been watching it maybe cast us into a, a mini civil war or a big <laughs> civil i mean the cascading effects of that and the violence that would have fo followed in the aftermath and the lives it's like it does make i think you said it in your book it's like jordan peterson were you the one who said this maybe or maybe was it in your book where you know Jordan Peterson is always like you have to admit that like you would have been a you might have been a Nazi oh, more yeah. than likely. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it, it is. I mean, it is crazy. It is deeply concerning. I mean, I think the only way to tackle all this stuff is is to talk about it. I think making fun of it is actually really important. I'm not just saying that mm -hmm. to flatter a comic like you, uh, but I actually do think it's very important to puncture some of this stuff by ridiculing it. That, that you know, there mm -hmm. is a reason, there is a reason that these kind of woke tards come for com comedy in particular. There is a reason they protested outside Netflix HQ over Dave Chappelle. And there, there is a reason they hate those people most of all, because, they know that when people start laughing at them, it's game over. They they know that that's really that's the really important turning point. When more and more people, you know, Sam Smith stands up and says he was on TV. Sam Smith was on TV in Britain a few uh, months ago, and he talked about how he likes to fish. He likes going fishing, and the presenter said to him, "Oh, you're a fisherman," and he said, "No, I'm a fisher them." And I remember. <laughs> Loads of people went online. My WhatsApp groups were blowing up um, saying, can you believe the word Fisher them? Isn't that the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard? <laughs> and I just thought if more people laugh at this, it won't last much longer. If, you know, if, if a bloke in a dress who's six foot tall and has a deep voice stands up and says, my name's Delilah and I'm a woman, and people laugh, <laughs> th then they will stop doing it. And I, I do, we I do need think to bring it, bullying back. <laughs> yeah, we'll bully them out of it. I, I do think that <laughs> there is definitely a really important role for ridicule, as well as yes. analysis and as well as principles. But I do think ridicule <laughs> and mockery that you know they've got a lot to 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 uh, to to going for them. I think they they play an important role. I mean, I look at the, I see Kill Tony as evidence of being where like things are kind of, the ship is writing because that podcast is huge. It's sold out Madison Square Garden and it is completely inappropriate. And <laughs> they never for a second back down from any of the bullshit. And I think, you know, people, flock to it and it is hilarious when you yeah. when you go and watch it live or even watch it on tv or wherever you watch or listen to it it is no it's it's like what roast i just did wrote judge roast battle too and roast battle is just like there's no holds barred people are making fun of each other's race class sex like it doesn't it's still in good spirit yeah. it's a equal opportunity everybody's getting 
taking the piss out of you're taking the piss out of yourself it's um I don't know. It, yeah. It's liberating. You know, there's yeah. a reason I think dictators like crack down on being able to tell jokes and being yeah. able to mock them. It's one of the first things they do is like, we will put you in the gulag if you make fun of us and you will disappear. Yeah. yeah, they take away your guns and they take away your right to make jokes. That's that's always the first things they do. And there's there is a very important reason for that. And, you know, there have been loads of comics over time who've who've made this point, you know, my one of my all time favorite comedians is Joan Rivers, and uh, she often made the case that this is how you this is how you knock down the pompous. This is how you knock down the yeah. idiocracy. You do it by making fun of them, and um, you know that joke that she got cancelled for, where she about Heidi <laughs> Klum. Uh, you know, where what she joke said, did she get can- I was like, was she, it the joke about Michelle Obama having a dick or was no, it she was on, that? she was on fashion police and she was talking about Heidi Klum's outfit and she's, and Heidi Klum looked amazing. And she said, Joan River said, a, a German has not looked this hot since they were shoving Jews into the ovens. And <laughs> oh, it was God. just so beautifully delivered. It was obviously delivered by a, a famously Jewish woman who has, uh, uh, relatives who died in the Holocaust, and it, but it was just funny and brutal and shocking, and she faced cancellation, and it was ridiculous, and you you just know she wouldn't have faced cancellation if it had been ten years earlier or fifteen years earlier. So that kind of um, antipathy towards comedy, I think, is a key part of how tyrannical things are becoming, which makes comedy all the more important. You know, winding people up mm-hmm. and taking taking the piss, as we say in Britain, is really an important thing to do. Yeah, and this is one of the things that I hope, w- like, the needle can be threaded because I do think uh, y- you don't, you know, even with all of these memes being spread and anti-Semitism, one of the default things is you can't make that joke. You can't, they suddenly get very, um, woke about Jews and now yeah. they're a protected class and now you can't joke about them and you can't you want to regulate the internet and I don't think that's the answer either. I yeah. think you I think it is just more knowledge. People need to be a little bit more educated. I don't know how we do that, but I don't think that that's the answer. I don't want there to be some extreme because then it only reinforces the belief too if you come for somebody and like uh, I can't, I can't even tell this story, but there's oftentimes a reaction. If somebody's, if somebody is saying something, it's anti-Semitic and then they get their, like this happened to Candace. And I was like, they shut down her YouTube channel for like seven days and she couldn't say anything. And I'm like, well, yeah. this doesn't help anything either because if you, mass cancel her and mass report her now you're only reinforcing the belief that the jews do control everything (laughs) and they're in charge absolutely and they're in charge i always ask the same two questions at the end of all my podcasts what's your biggest defect of character now we're gonna make it about you oh my god so this is therapy in a way um Mm -hmm. that's a great question i probably have quite a lot of character defects um I have a tendency to laziness. It drives me. Mm. I know that's a bit of a boring one, but it does drive me around the twist. I I I let deadlines creep right up on me and then I go insane and try to get everything done. Um so I have a tendency towards laziness. I have a slight tendency to to be slightly panglossian as well. I'm I'm optimistic as I said earlier. But that can sometimes become unrealistic. So I'll be in the workplace and I'll say, yeah, we can get this done. And everyone else around me is shaking their head saying, you're a lunatic. Um, So I'm a bit like that as well. I think that's probably, I don't have any really bad ones, I don't think. I'm not evil or (laughs) I don't have any kind of violent tendencies. But yeah, I I would say that a, a propensity to be lazy is something that really drives me around the twist. What's yours? I'd be intrigued to know what yours is. Oh, I'm sure you've talked about it before. Uh, it, it's funny. Most people don't ask me what mine is. 
I, I usually get away with that being <laughs> one sided. <laughs> um, I have a lot. I I have a tendency to be very spiteful. And Ooh. like I joke that my stinger is filled with spite. I'm very much <laughs> like I'm Irish, but I'm also Italian and French. And the wow. Italian in me, I always say like when I'll I'm very loyal, but if somebody kind of burns me, I will like something awakens in my heart and I'll be like, you're fucking dead to me now. <laughs> and I'm also, I don't think that I'm, um, I, I don't think that I'm, I'm, um, I'm not a fair, it's not, it's like a, what's what? I don't even know what the, you have a better vocabulary than me. It, it's, like I, I'll just destroy you quietly <laughs> behind closed doors so yeah. that you don't know it. Yeah. I won't be, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't like confrontation. Yeah. So instead of being like courageous and confronting somebody with something, I will just ruin their life behind closed <laughs> doors if I, yeah. if I can. <laughs> yeah, that might that might not be a defect. That might be the right way to do things. You know, who, who are we to judge? But it's it's interesting to hear you talk about Spike because um, there's a famous journalist in Britain called Julie Burchill who now writes for Spike. I'm very happy about that. And she was once asked, um, "Do you have any hobbies?" And she said, "Lunch and Spite," which I thought was mm. just the two perfect hobbies to have: go to lunch and be spiteful. Why not? Yeah, I think I used to be pretty, and I think that duplicitousness is something I really struggle with just even being an addict and um, I have it. Yeah, it's like a, I always said to my first, like, it's like a general squirreliness or shadiness that I don't yeah. like about myself right. that I've actually improved upon quite a lot, but I still often fail, Right. Um, yeah. fail myself. Yeah. Yeah. And others. So yeah, those are the that's the those are the big <laughs> ones. I wish that I was I Good. wish I was more confrontational. I think it would be better for me to be like more radically honest or whatever. But you um, know, if you it, it, sometimes you see confrontations in public, like you'll be in a Walmart and people will be having I the loudest that. argument. And I just to me that's a very alien thing. It's like when I see people speaking on their um mobile phone on the bus. I don't understand how people can do that. I don't understand how you can have a conversation, an intimate conversation with a friend that everyone else can hear. To maybe it's because this is a new thing, relatively speaking. To me, those that kind of noisy confrontation, those that outspokenness, that loudness in public, I've always felt slightly uncomfortable with that. But I'm but totally. I'm totally and and I and well, I, I have two I have um very different parental figures my parents are divorced but one is very kind of i would say keeps their cards close to the vest is slightly shady never really know <laughs> what's the truth and i feel like there's a part of them that i can never really access or know and i think i lean more towards that than like my fiery italian other side that it has no problem being completely emotionally self-indulgent in public and throwing like f a fit and making a scene and i always found that to be like it made me squirm and yeah. i think also coming from divorce you i just naturally am like co conflict averse yeah. Like I, I grew up yeah. in a lot of conflict and I just want people to get along and I don't want to have it, but it, it works against me. I should just be more direct. I think it would be, I, I it would be who it's something I should work on. Yeah. I grew up in a, a, a huge family. I've got, there were six, six boys. My, my parents had six boys, no girls. Oh, wow. And we had a lodger as well for a period of time. So there were like eight people, nine people in our tiny, tiny house. Um, a council house, we call it here. I don't think we call it there, government funded housing. Um, very crowded, very noisy. So from an early age, I had to develop those skills of trying to avoid confrontation or trying to uh, put the lid on confrontation because otherwise you, mm. we wouldn't have survived. So, you know, it, it, I think environment as well as culture 
not that these things determine who we are and we can always change who we are if we really want to, but they do have a big impact on how people think and behave for sure. Oh yeah. I'm the oldest of five, mostly girls. So it's a different right. energy, but still just like lots of, lots of pu kids around all the time and just like yeah. full house constantly and yeah. constant noise, constant chaos. Nothing is ever where yeah. you left it. I remember when I first <laughs> lived by myself and I would like leave something there and then it would be there when I got back. Amazing. I was like, what is this sorcery? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Um, there was never enough food, you know. No. I think we were just always like eat, churning through so much yeah. food. And for me and my brothers, like, it was um, deodorant. We were always because we were all we're all close in age, and we all became teenagers around the same time. Six oh, young wow. men. We were always running out of deodorant. I mean, we would have literal fist fights over link <laughs> deodorant and who would get the last spray before they went out on a Saturday night. I mean, that was really what we fought over. <laughs> we ate so fast too. Like even still, I have to slow myself down because it was like, that was the, whoever finished first got seconds. Yeah. It was really yeah. very much like you either, <laughs> you're either quick or you starve. And yeah, my dad's absolutely. one of 10. So like our extended family is huge and there were you know 26 first cousins many of us it was just like chaos growing up and yeah, absolutely. people when i was judging the roast battle one of the roasters was like oh have you ever roasted i'm like no like i my i'm an irish catholic in a big family like my whole upbringing was a roast battle i don't need to like <laughs> yeah. relive my childhood yeah <laughs> yeah that's yeah. a good way to describe it it was a, a roast battle from day one <laughs> people like us yeah yeah yeah, and you're like, oh, you didn't want to be the sensitive one. It's like, oh, you're gonna cry about it, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was baby, grandma no saying that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that wasn't your cousin. It was grandma yeah. being like, don't cry. Yeah, yeah fucking you cry in this yeah. family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Irish women, man, they're tough. Oh they my are god, tough. my my grandmothers were. Uh, people have no idea. I mean. One of my grandmothers was illiterate. She grew up in the extreme west of Ireland. She never traveled more than 40 miles from where she lived. She milked the cows, including on the days that she gave birth. I mean, it, it's just a different world, a completely different totally world. Totally different. I, uh, you know, and they were tough as nails. And yeah. we'd go and visit them in Ireland when we were 13, and they'd say, you know, here's, have a glass of whiskey. And you couldn't say no to it. That would have been incredibly <laughs> offensive. She, you know, it all put hairs on your chest. I want to go. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, yeah. <laughs> Can't say no. Sorry. Yeah. No wonder I'm a drunk. That's where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. Blame granny. What's your biggest asset before your computer dies? Uh, yeah. My biggest asset, I think, is I God, that's a that's an even more difficult question because who likes to blow their own trumpet? Because you're but, Irish. Um Yeah, exactly. So we're a bit coy, we're a bit meek. Um I was brought up a Catholic, so we have to kind of, you know, we're not allowed to boast yeah. too much. Um, we're not allowed to be proud. That, that Pride question's is a way sin. harder for me than what are <laughs> yeah. my defects. Yeah, me too. I think um I I I think one thing I do pretty well when I do it is I'm I'm willing to approach issues from an angle that I don't think anyone else is approaching them from. So I love to switch the narrative. And um I know that people refer to it as contrarianism, but I really don't think it is contrarianism. I really think it is a desire to look at the world differently to how most people look at it and look at it with fresh eyes so and that can that can make life quite exciting because it means that you wake up you read the news you talk to your friends you look at what's going on in the world and and you think hold on is there a way that i can slightly turn this on its head is there a way that i can dig out the point that other people are missing is there a way i can come at this that will excite readers and excite listeners and make them think differently as well so I'm pretty good, I think, at just upending the narratives that we all suffocate under. But you made this point earlier, which I think is a really important point. I said that future historians will do more of that stuff. And you said, well, actually, people are doing it now. So one of the nice things for me, because I've been in this game for a really long time, is 
just the growing number of voices who are doing likewise, the growing number of voices who are just saying, maybe everything we've been told is bollocks. <laughs> maybe we mm -hmm. need a completely different way to understand the problems facing society. I think that's probably one of my best skills and probably the only thing that has allowed me to carry on in the world of commentary and letters is the fact that I am willing to say, uh, this is bollocks, this is not right. And there has got to be a better way to explain this problem. Mm, I love that. That was a great answer. Thank you. Where can one find you if they want to find your work and yourself and your book? Um, best place is Spiked. I write for Spiked very regularly. People should be reading Spiked all the time. Spiked-online.com. Easily the best online magazine in the Western world, no question. Um, I write for other outlets as well, so they can Google me and find me there. I suppose they could look at me on Instagram, but I'm not very social media friendly. I'm, I don't really know what social media is all about, but I am on Instagram at Burnt Oak Boy, so they could take a look at that as well. Uh, I hate social media, but I need it. <laughs> it's awful. I mean, I love Twitter. I'm like, I, it's, I hate that I'm great at Twitter, but yeah. I really am great yeah. at it. Well, I quote, <laughs> I quote you in the book and I quote a tweet. So you've got to be oh. really, yeah, I, you did a tweet, um, where you said in relation, God, this is going to get really dark now so before, just as we're wrapping it up, but in relation to the post 7th of October, rape denialism you did this amazing tweet where you said i can't believe we've gone from uh believe all women to rape pics or it didn't happen and mm. it was just you nailed it you just really nailed it and I, and I, so i've included that and i i think people who use twitter well should probably use twitter all the time you know why not it's not evil it's just it's not for me i think <laughs> yeah, I mean, I but it, it it is like I should have a book, you know. I I do. It's just on Twitter. Um, the, yeah. and I said on Twitter as well during the like October seventh. I never really understood how the Holocaust happened. Like I didn't understand it until post October seventh when I yeah. was like, oh, yeah, this is, this how, is it how it happened. happened. Yeah, now I we didn't know. understand it. I was like, how were yeah. people? One of the one of the I have the. Uh, it's called The Choice and it's from a Holocaust survivor. It's a memoir and she talks, it's like such a scene that's just drilled into my head from her memoir of being on the train and seeing people just going about their lives, like going yeah. to the farmer's market and yeah. walking around in these towns as, tr you know, train loads of people are passing through and yeah. no one was like, hmm, that yeah. smell coming from downwind <laughs> and all of these people that seems like it should be something we should worry about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now, as you say, now, sadly, we know how that happened. And yeah, we can, it yeah. was in instructive. We, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for writing this. And I'm sure we'll hear all about it from the people who, you know, know we're being paid <laughs> by the zionists yeah yeah i, I was know. when i was in new york i was with michael moynihan we were at a dinner and we were like die he's very funny and we were dying laughing and i was like i swear to god i'm making a t-shirt just say jew and he's like you need to make it absolutely absolutely <laughs> like, wear it to jew. wear it to every <laughs> protest it just would be so good yeah <laughs> Yeah. That's going to be my next, like, <laughs> yeah. debate me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Have a good night or, we're at, yeah, night. And thank you. And please keep in touch. Thank Let you so much. Let me know if you're coming Bridget. to Texas. I will do. Thank you so much. And keep up the excellent right. work. It's brilliant. You as well. Thank you. Thank you. We're in the trenches together, my friend. <laughs> we are. All right. I'll talk to you soon. The check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie can now be found at Phetasy.com. It's been titled Another Round with Bridget Phetasy, and it's now in video. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>